be emceeing the day. I suck at jokes, so uh, don't hate me too much. Anyway, without further ado, Shirley Wu. While Shirley's getting ready, she's a freelance data visualization engineer. And a fun fact about her, by the time she was 18, she lived in four different countries and eight different cities all along the Pacific. I've never le lived anywhere besides Chicago. <laughs> no, it's not. <laughs> Just kidding. And the thing 
things I found using the filter tool I built for this specific purpose. And by the time they get to the very end, I give them the filter tool that I built where they can filter by any set of characters, conversations, and themes, and dig into the remaining lines and songs to do their own analysis. And as you can probably imagine, when I got started on this project, the data set wasn't available online or offline or anywhere, and I had to go and find the data myself. And so the two main questions that guided me through this project was I was very curious about how do the relationships change between the characters through the musical? And number two, what recurring phrases are there throughout the musical and who are they associated with? And again, because none of this is available online, I had to go through the lyrics twice, first noting all of those recurring phrases and grouping them into broad themes. And the second time around, going through the lyrics again so that I can manually enter them into my computer, entering the themes, the characters, and conversations, so that I can write a script to aggregate all of those metadata by song and line number and get my final data set. <laughs> so this project and many similar other ones have taught me the very important lesson that if I just have a curiosity, usually, most of the time, there's a way for me to go and get that data, whether by manual entry, which is not very fun, but, or automated scripts. And I found that there's like an R or node package for basically anything I can think of under the sun already. So that's also really hopeful. Keeping in mind that I just need to stay within the boundaries of the law. <laughs> I'm never, I'm never, I've, I've always said, I'm, I'm just saying, there's some data that you probably can't get legally, and you should probably stay away from those. That's, that's my lesson there. <laughs> and so once you got the data, once I've gotten the data, the second learn lesson I've learned over the years is to make sure to explore that data before you get started on your designs. This is one of my personal projects, and it's one of my favorite personal projects called Four Years of Vacations in 20,000 Colors, where I've gone and taken the five primary colors of about 4,000 images I've taken over 13 trips. I've grouped each of those colors into the, <coughs> the trip that I was taken on, and I arranged them by the day that they were taken on. And the reason why this visualization is one of my personal favorites is because I learned a lot about myself and how I travel from this visualization, which is that when I first got this working and I started looking at it, um, all of the greens and blues made sense to me because when I travel, I love taking pictures of nature. I love seeing water, seeing ocean, seeing um, mountains, trees, all of the blues and greens. I was really confused as to why there was so many reds and yellows. So when I went and took a look at the underlying photo of those colors, it turns out that they were all food pictures. <laughs> Which means that this trip to Japan back in 2014, that's basically all food, that's all we did apparently <laughs> in Tokyo. Um, I didn't realize this at the time, but this one um, was to Iceland in 2015, so that's a, got a good balance of like, Lots of nature, lots of lakes, glaciers, and some food, um, which is why Chicago has been really great for me so far. <laughs> but this project didn't actually start out so well. So by the time I had gone and gathered all of my data, like it was, it was a long kind of arduous process of finding all of my pictures from my like old iPhones and like you know, grouping them was a very manual process. I was so tired of the data that I didn't even kind of bother to look into my data. I didn't explore it, I didn't try to understand it. And all I did was I was like, well, you know, it's my data, I probably understand it. So let me just sketch out this like really ugly, rough, you know, idea for a visualization. And the things that I'm interested in, like I'm curious about, you know, when and where that I usually take my pictures. And so I had this kind of sketch where the x-axis is either morning, noon, night, when during the day that I've taken it, or um, the continents that I might have taken them on. And then the y-axis is uh, the time, the years. 
And I was like, you know, this probably should tell me something about myself. So I went and without, you know, again, looking through my data at all, without any understanding of the data, I put it on the screen. And this is, this is what, uh, this is what it looked like. Um, and, you know, it's, it's been like a year or two, so I like to, it, the, there's distance, and I like to call this my, um, it's, it's one of my favorite pieces now. I like to call this my art piece of uh, man peeing into a puddle. Um, it's good. Um, but, you know, at the time I was like, oh, this is ugly. You know, I can't put this out there. And so I had to take a step back and kind of really ask myself, um, how can I understand this data better? What are the metadata that each of the photos have, do each of the photos have, each of those data points have? And when I took a step back and I thought about it, I realized that you know, each of these colors, each of these data points, um, the metadata I had was number one, I had the trip that I had taken it on. So I decided to group all of those colors by the trips. And that already started looking quite interesting. Then I realized that I had this temporal data, the date it was taken on. And so I decided to map that to the angle of the color. And finally, I had information on each of the colors. I could get the hue, saturation, lightness. And so I decided to map hue to the radius. And that's how I got my final visualization. And so this one really, really taught me now, when I'm going through a data set, first of all, I really need to understand and explore my data. And once I've done that, list out all of the data attributes and figure out which ones are the most important to me that I can then assign them to visual channels, like, like radius, like XY positions, like color, size. And then make sure to watch out for any extremes and outliers that I might have. So now that we've talked about how and where to get data, I want to now talk about design and designing for visualizations. Personally, as a developer, this is probably the hardest part of the process for me. Um, I'm not very good at the design part. So over the years, I've kind of, kind of um, come up with a set of rules for myself, guidelines. And the most important one for me, I've found, is this one, that I should design always with a question in mind. And then that question leads to a design that doesn't have anything interesting, that leads nowhere. Then try a different question. Last year, I had the pleasure of working with Google News Labs and their search data dating back to 2004, just massive. Um, and this is the piece I did for them where I wondered about their travel search data, and I wondered about what each country searches for in other countries for their vacations. And so, for example, right now, we're in the U.S., and it's fall time, and so I might wonder, what's the U.S. searching for in other parts of the U.S.? And for whatever reason, it's apparently Squall Valley. Um, let's look at this one that has the most, this one in Egypt. And apparently, we search for Nile and the Giza, I can look and I can expand it and look at other countries that are searching for the place. And when I first got started on this project, um, I had scoped down the data to just the travel search data, which was so extremely overwhelming because it's Google search data. Um, and I decided that I should just ask a series of questions and explore the data kind of in this visual fashion to see if I could get anything interesting out of it. And so the very first question I asked myself was, what is the top search country for travel and who's searching for that country? And it turns out it was Brazil, but the visualizations I used didn't give me much of anything interesting other than perhaps the fact that um, <clears throat> people seem to be searching for travel in places that are closer to them. And that was the only thing I found, so I decided to move on to the next question I was interested in, which is what kind of topics are being searched for in each country. And this particular design was really hard to read, so I tried another one and another one. And perhaps it was just that my designs were bad, or perhaps there really wasn't anything that was too interesting. 
that could be answered from these questions, but I couldn't really get anything out of them. And so I decided to change my focus yet again. And I remembered that there was that thing about geography that was interesting earlier. So I asked myself, does geography play a part in who searches for a country? And even though this question seemed quite promising, um, I went through quite a few different iterations and found nothing interesting. And I was really desperate at this point because <laughs> it's been like a month of like trying to find designs that would really work for the data. Until I remembered again that in an earlier on search that I had seen something interesting about seasonality, about who searches for where, when. And the first try and design I tried didn't work out for me until, until I tweaked the design just a little bit and there it was the insight that I was looking for, that I could build a whole story around. That the US, at least in the US, we search for vacations most in the springtime. Probably really excited about that summer vacation. And we search for it again in summer. But we search the least in the fall, probably because we've gone back to school. And so I'm not telling you to go and do all of that a ridiculous amount of back and forth that I just did because you know it was really time consuming, especially because I was doing it stupidly from D3, um, like just from scratch every single time. But I would encourage you to, when you get the data, to get it onto the screen as soon as possible and explore it with software, with any software that you're comfortable with, whether it's R or Tableau or Python or D3 or any other charting library. And the reason for this is because I think Designing for data visualizations is a little bit different from our normal design process for the web, which is that in the web, we probably know exactly where everything should go, where that header should go, where that buttons should go. But when we're designing for data, we rarely, really know how the shape of that data is going to turn out or how it's going to look until we put it onto the screen. So we've talked about getting the data and designing a visualization with that data in mind. And now we're now I want to talk about the part that we're probably all really, really good with, which is the code. And I think coding for data visualizations is a little bit different from coding normally also, which is that it really involves a lot of drawing shapes onto the screen. And the way we draw shapes onto the screen is with SVG and Canvas. And one of the best things I've done for myself is teach myself SVG pass and how curve commands work. Because with those under my belt, I found that I can really draw any shapes onto the screen that my mind can come up with and dream up. So learn to love SVG pass, math, and trigon trigonometry. <coughs> And to show that, I want to share with you this project I did called Film Flowers, where I took the past, the top summer blockbusters of the last two and a half decades and reimagined them as flowers. Where the petal shapes are parental guidance ratings, the colors, <laughs> the colors are different um, genres. The number of petals and the size of the flower, it's this IMDb rating out of 10. So there's some really beautiful ones in here. Like I really love the Dark Knight Rises right here. Um, there is Inception, uh, Harry Potter will always hold a special place in my heart. But the one that I share every single time that's my absolute favorite, is this 1997 Batman and Robin. <laughs> because it's so teeny and tiny and cute. <laughs> but when I first put this visualization out there, I got asked the question of, how did you do that? Did it take a lot of time? Was it really hard to come up with all of those? And it's actually, the answer is, it's actually really not it's very actually quite simple and straightforward and all you need is just a good grasp of this thing called the cubic bezier curve command and I'll show you how. So let's recreate one of those cherry blossoms that we had earlier and let's start out by drawing one of those petals and so we start out with this curve on one end 
Um, and the way that I like to think about how to draw this curve is that we start out with a point, the black zero, zero, and I think of it as I draw a straight line to my end point, that purple point at the bottom, and I take those two anchor points, the green and blue, and I nudge them out until I get the curve that I want. It's very much like if you use a pen tool in Illustrator or in Photoshop. I then draw two more lines, and I draw that same curve back on the other hand, and then I already have one of the petal shapes. I rotate those petals across, put in some colors, and that's it. That's actually, it's actually, that's all there is to those visualizations. But just drawing shapes onto the screen doesn't give us full data visualizations. And to do that, you might have heard of this library called D3. But you might also have heard that D3 has a little bit of a learning curve. A little bit. <laughs> I, heard, I, heard a, I heard a snicker. <laughs> but, sorry. There's a little bit of a learning curve. Um, mainly in that we as the developers have to manage the updates to the DOM ourselves. But if that sounds familiar, that's because it's exactly what libraries like React or Vue are really great at. So what I've done, what I've learned to do over the years is to let React or Vue do all of that rendering, all of that updates to the DOM that kind of makes it hard in D3, and let D3 do what it's so uniquely good at, which is to calculate and translate your raw data into what you need to draw it onto the screen. And to do that, I want to, um, I have this example, I have this very simple example, um, and I need to put a disclaimer out there that this is not necessarily a good visualization, but it's a great example, um, where I visualized, um, the temperatures, the 2017 temperatures for San Francisco and New York in this kind of radial format where, um, you know, the top here, um, it starts out in, um, in January and then um, loops around. And I want to code this with you um, to show that it's a lot more straightforward um, to manage and do with React and D3. Is that me? That is me. Sorry about the messages I'm getting. Um, so let's do this together. I've also just realized that I have a bug. Um, so if anybody else realizes it, let me know. <laughs> so this is what the code looks like. It's very simple. Um, in my app.js, all I do is go and fetch my data for SF and New York. And down here, I just have these two charts, radio chart and chart. And I'm going to go into chart.js and code this. And so I'm going to calculate my data and get derived state from props. Um, I'm just going to do that here because it's the easiest place to do it, but it might not be the same place you might do it. Um, so to start out with, the way that we're going to get all of these colored bars is with a D3 function called arcs. And with arcs, it's going to, what it does is it helps us draw pies, pie charts, slices in a pie chart. And what it needs is the start angle, the end angle, the inner radius, and outer radius for each of those slices. And I'm going to map the start angle to the day of that temperature and I'm gonna map the inner radius to the lower temperature for that day, the outer radius to the higher temperature, and I'm going to color it with just the average temperature. So the very first thing I might want to do is just calculate the radian for each of those angles, or for the, sorry, the radian for each of those slices. So I'm gonna do two times math dot pi divide by the length of the data, in which case, for this case, it'd be 365. I'm going to create, I'm going to go and get the maximum temperature for, for the year for the city. So I'm going to do that, D, and I'm going to tell it I want to use the high temperature to get my max. 
And then here I'm going to create this thing called a scale. And what D3Scales do for us is it maps things from its domain to things from its range. And what I mean by that is now I can say that I want to map zero to the max temperature and I want to map that to zero to width divided by two. So essentially I want to map my lowest temperatures to the middle and my highest temperatures to all the way out um, to the full half of the width. And then I want to do the same thing for, I want to create a scale for the fill. So I'm going to go out and get the min and max average temperature for our data set. So I do, I tell it, I'm um, sorry, I would use D3 extent, which will give me back the min and max. And I tell it I want the min and max of the average. I go and create a scale. And this one I'll call a scale sequential and that one what that will do is it will map my domain of the average the min and max average temperature to this thing called interpolate red yellow blue and then I believe this should work and then finally I need to create an arc generator with d3 arc gen is equal to d3 dot arcs arc arcs um, and now I should be able to calculate everything I need to draw each of those slices. So data.map, and for each slice, I just say, I want to get the SVG path um, where, for each of the slices, the inner radius is radius scale pass in my low temperature. Outer radius is equal to radius scale pass in my high temperature. My start angle, is, oh, I need the index actually. I need the index of that slice. So index times my uh, my radian, the, the angle of my slice, and my end angle should be my index plus one times per angle. I'm going to fill the color with fill scale and pass in the average. And if I've done all of this right and and then return the slices, then if I console log here, I should be able to see an array. Nope, arc is not defined. Thank you so much. I made the exact same mistake in my practice. <laughs> Perfect. So, now you'll see this is um, this is the fill that I'm going to have, and for each of those slices, this is the SVG path command to draw those slices. And now that I have those, I should just be able to go into my render function and say this dot state dot slices dot map, and then for each of those, use an SVG path element. Use the path command we just uh, created. Fill is equal to d dot fill. Okay, let's see if it works. Yes! Okay, there we go. There's the slices. Um, thank you. Do you, do you see the, the bug I have here now? I just had the, the colors reversed. <laughs> um, so now I want to, of course, uh, there's these uh, little circles that kind of denote where each of the uh, degrees are. So um, I'm just going to go and quickly create those. Um, and for those, all it takes is circles and text elements. So I'm going to call these axes is equal to, let me make it for 20, 40 degrees, 80, 60 degrees, 80 degrees. And for each of those, I will go and I return the radius. So radius scale and I pass in that. And then text, I just give back that temperature. And then here, I believe I can just say this, oh, no, I need to pass this back, axes. And then here, I believe all I have to do is, again, map those um, axes, return a group element, and then return a circle with the radius equal to d dot radius that we just calculated. Um, and then I'm going to say fill is none, and I'm going to stroke it with a gray and hopefully I'll get perfect and then 
I'll have the text and that's the last thing I need to do and that would be the Y and I believe I can just do, can I just do, wait, hold on, I can just do d.text and hopefully these are the only elements we need to draw those. And there you go. That's it. That's all it takes to recreate this visualization with D3 and React. So, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. And so, I just kind of threw a bunch, a lot of things at you. So, I want to say, start out small. Code a simple chart with React and D3, like the one I just did. Once that starts feeling comfortable, um, try and teach yourself some SVG pads, create some custom shapes out of those. Then go out and, you know, if you still love it, go out and get some books on information design, follow some blogs about data visualizations, watch some talks from visualization conferences. Really kind of get a sense for yourself of what works, what's good about a data visualization and what doesn't work and try those, try what you've learned on your own designs. Recreate chart, a chart with your own design. And then go out, find a curiosity for yourself, go get the data, explore it, and before you know it, you will have created a custom data visualization from start to finish. And to help with that, to help with some of the steps from the previous slide, um, I've created a series of workshops on front end masters that take you from the very basics of SVG, of shapes, of drawing shapes, um, all the way to the very end of something a little bit more advanced of exploring the data and designing and coding your own custom data visualization. So if you're interested, I would love it if you check out the workshop, but I would love it and I will hope, I hope, I hope that with all of this, that you fall in love with D3, with data visualizations just like I did, and that I hope you will join me in creating meaningful, custom, interactive data visualizations for the web. Thank you. disclaimer of saying this is not a good visualization okay, okay. Yeah, the, the, but the question applies to like even the one with the, the flowers and the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the lyrics it's like that's great the, this it looks wonderful and mm -hmm. it's kind of fun to play around with mm -hmm. because I think I've seen similar tools but like what did you learn from that mm -hmm. okay you so know? that's a really great question um and so I, I'll answer it in a general sense and I'll answer it in a specific sense so in the general sense for data visualizations, every time I have a project, um, it really depends on either the client and what the client wants to get out of it. Um, and so I work with them to design visualizations um, to answer their questions. Um, and so, for example, I guess um, I actually just um, had the opportunity to work with um, MSNBC for their election coverage. And so what they wanted to get out of it was a specifically um, the House of Representatives and the districts that they might need to, um, that either parties might need to win to get to a House majority. And so for those, I worked with them um, on a series of like actually very simple bar charts that they can show on TV and interact with them to filter, di filter it down to just the districts that they might be telling a story on. So they might be able to say like, oh, um, I want to look at the districts where, you know, um, Trump performed this way and Obama performed this way with this sort of a demographic and filter down on each of those and then show the districts that are left over. So there's, those are kind of like the cases of for each of the visualizations, it's very different depending on what the client or I'm trying to get out of it. 
Um, for the Hamilton itself, for example, um, I kind of really breezed through it because I don't want to get into any of the details, but like that one was really enjoyable because I actually, um, if you have the opportunity to read the analysis I did, um, all of that uh, I got from uh, exploring the visualization. Um, and so personally, I loved what I got out of it because I'm a huge Hamilton fan. Um, but yeah, I think there are definitely um, visualizations where it's just pretty for the sake of being pretty. But um, that's why I think it's really important to kind of think about the design, think about the questions that you're trying to answer, the data you're trying to represent. Um, and that's what I cover in some of my longer workshops. Yeah, yeah thank you so much. <laughs> sure. <laughs> Sorry, I, I knew, we know each other. <laughs> So um, the performance tab in Chrome DevTools is my friend, sometimes my best friend. Um, and it's very simple. It's probably exactly what you do when you build a website. Um, I just, uh, a lot of times I'll record, um, I'll just hit record and I'll take a look at which functions of mine are taking the longest amount of time. Um, the thing that's been really helpful that I didn't know was there until like, half a year ago or something, or a year ago, was um, apparently I could actually, um, let me actually show, um, I could simulate um, a slower computer. So I can go to the performance tab and then I can say um, I want CPU throttling to be 4x slowdown or 6x throttling slowdown, and then I want my network to be fast or slow or 3G or um, and this actually has helped me a lot because um, I have a beefy like MacBook Pro that's 16 gigs of RAM and that's not how it is with a lot of the people that I'm building this for. Um, and so this has been really helpful to even just enable these. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I'll be here, because I think I'm out of time, but I'll be here. Um, so if you have any questions during breaks or anything, thank you so much.